is uh, all right. So we're gonna do postfix. So postfix is SMTP, right? That's email, and this is the Linux version of email. So let me sudo app get install postfix. All right. So postfix is the name of the SMTP program. All right, and again, hopefully you guys are on a fresh, clean image. And basically it goes through, does its thing, asks you yes, do you want to install? Yes, I am recording this. All right, so you're going to get a configuration, right? Just hit the tab key. We're going to be an internet site. All right. So internet sites are fun. So our mail system name. The convention is to call things mail, right? And what we're going to do is we're, when you do this, includes all mail to and from root, right? So basically the idea is part of this process is that you want to do mail dot your box name, your class name. All right. So you basically want to go ahead and put in the full, fully qualified domain name, right? The convention in the world, the convention in the world is to call your mail system mail, right? So everybody knows. You know that in your DNS, you'll want to make a, an MX record then when you set up this in your DNS, an MX record for a mail instructor, blah, 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 with the IP address, all right? And then just hit OK. And it goes through, does its thing. It does do its own SSL cert, which is kind of cool. All right? So you don't have to go ahead and do so. It's going to set its domain to local, local host. All right? So what we want to do once it's installed, right? It's up, it's running, it's good to go. What we want to do is we want to configure it. So we want to go sudo dpkg reconfigure postfix. All right, so sudo dpackage reconfigure postfix. What? There you go. All right, so what this is going to do is it's going to give you a bunch of options that you can choose from. All right, so if your configuration doesn't work, that sudo dpackage reconfigure postfix, just like we had to do with LDAP, if you don't get everything right the first time, you can actually go back and reconfigure it. It is highly recommended that you use the reconfigure option rather than going in and editing any of the configuration files. Okay, so this is just the easy way of doing it. All right? Again, it gives you the same thing that we're an internet site, that our DNS, root and postmaster email address. This is new. So root at mail.ci.instructor.cis217. Now the reason why we want to set a root user account for this, right? And it can be anybody. It doesn't have to be root. Root's a convention, right? This is the way it's always done and sometimes always doing something is not the right way of doing it, to be dead honest, right? So but what that does is that anything that can't be delivered will be delivered to root. So if there's a bad email address, if there's a bunch of spam, if there's a bunch of other horrible things in there, right? All of it will go to root, but it's also really good for debugging issues, right? Usually what you'll see is a bunch of debug information in this so that if you're having a mail transport or your email system goes down external to you or something else, it will tell you can't deliver, right? So this is one good way of getting really good debug information along with finding out how overloaded your email server is, right? So we want to set root and postmaster, right? So root. Right? Other destinations to accept for mail. Other destinations to accept mail. I'm going to accept mail from Instructor CIS 217. That's my domain. Right? You'll notice that mail was taken off of that. It's going to accept mail from my domain. It's going to accept mail that's delivered from Ubuntu with no .com, no .ot, no .edu. So I can do root at Ubuntu, and it will accept that as mail. So not a really good security kind of thing. Right? It will accept from local host, local domain, local host, a lot of other things right? to kind of go through this. So we just kind of, if you wanted to, you could take out Ubuntu, but we're not for this case. right? 
So we're just going to go OK. Force synchronous updates on mail queue. If you force a synchronous update, that means everything will have to update at the same time. The answer to this is no, right? You don't want your email to process slowly. Email is kind of one of those weird leftover protocols from the, 19, from the 1890s. It's what's called store and forward, right? And store and forward is kind of an interesting process. In other words, an email comes in, and I'm going to store it until I can either deliver it to the recipient's email box or I can send it on to something else. So if your email service goes down upstream, so if our Comcast goes down, we'll still be storing all that email for delivery. So kind of an interesting, kind of important concept to know is that no email is actually really truly lost. It will keep on trying to deliver it, right? So if we force that queue synchronization to do that, it may go wrong, right? So remember, email is store and forward. So it's kind of one of those things. So we don't want to force synchronous updates on the mail queue, right? So local networks. What I'm going to have you do is I'm going to have you keep it local for right now because the local networks is telling me who I'll accept email from at the IP address level. And right now all I want to do is I want to accept it from my local host, my local network, right? I don't really want to accept anything else from anybody else right now. When you go in and you do this, you poke you type in your 192.168.203.0 slash 8 to accept everything from email in here. And this is one way that we keep spam down in this classroom, right? Because spam is what? Bad. Spam is bad. So we just click on OK for here. Mailbox limit size. Some people put in quotas. All right. If you're running an ISP, you're going to put a quota in here. Say it's 25 megabits, 25 gigabits, right? Your email box size is basically limited by how many boxes you have by how much disk drive space you have, right? So if you want no quotas, if you want no limits on the amount of stuff people can pack rat in their email, you leave it at zero, okay? That means no quota, no limit, no nothing. It's all yours. Store as much stuff as you can but it will use as much hard drive space as it needs to store all that good stuff. So if I send you a bunch of 25 megabit attachments, I can overrun that hard drive really, really quickly. So you kind of want to make sure of what you're kind of thinking on this one, right? right? So right now we're just going to leave it at zero, but you can also set it to something like five gigs. Right? So you can always set it. That's an upper bound. right? And you'll see quota management in a lot of email systems. So when you guys do exchange, you'll see quota limits that you can set there. All right, so just go OK. Do not use address extensions, right? So the character that would be used to define a local address extension can be anything in this, right? Because a local address extension is basically what I'm going to call myself, right? .edu, .com, .org, all that other kind of good stuff. So we're just going to kind of leave it open because we don't know who we're going to be getting email from. All right? Now, the cool part is that you can use IPv4 and IPv6. And I'd like you to leave it as all. Because if you're out in a real ISP or you're out in a real world environment, you don't know if you're going to get IPv6 or IPv4. All right? So if you leave it this way, then you don't have to go back and reconfigure your SMTP server later on to accept IPv6. So this is really kind of a new change that just came out recently for this whole thing, right? So this box will accept IPv4 and IPv6 ad IP addresses for looking up someone's domain and all the rest of it. So I would leave it as all because then you don't have to come back later and try to reconfigure it for IPv6, right? All you've got to do then is reinitialize your NIC card with an IPv6 address as well, and then you're good to go. You don't have to touch your email server. So this is really kind of a cool thing. All right? It's a cool thing if you're kind of techie geeky like I am. All right? And then that's it. It goes back, checks everything, makes sure that you're good to go, restarts it, and if we restart it, we're good to go. And that's it for PostFix. It's one of the simplest installs that you've got. Right? This is one of those things you could whip out in like about 15 minutes. Because a lot of it is just kind of default. Because right? you want it to talk to everybody, you want it to know everybody, Right? You want to be big, happy, friendly internet? Now the interesting part is, and I went ahead and I checked this before we all got going, right, was to make sure that people actually had Outlook. 
right? So if you've got Outlook and you've got SMTP running, just bring up your Outlook. You can configure for internet email, right? So your name, your email address is dan at and then a password. Next. So what it's trying to do is it's trying to find someone by DNS. So you have to have DNS up and running when you do this. But to test your SMTP configuration, hook your Outlook to this box and make sure that you can send and receive emails back and forth. And I had you install this on a fresh box with no DNS, right? So this should pretty much so bounce off because it doesn't have any idea on what's going on here. It has absolutely no idea because I don't have DNS on this, right? So you can verify things and all the rest of it. But the other thing you can do too, manually configure server settings, right? So this is a, another part of the whole process. If you manually configure it, we're going to do internet email, right? And then user information, pop three, incoming mail server. And because I'm just local, right? And because we're using Linux, it's POP and SMTP. Login information. This is the person that can actually authorize use that account. Right? So you'd put in their authorization. And I just never remember passwords because I want people to type in their password. You can go into more settings and bring up any kind of organization or reply email, your outbound server. Right? If your outbound requires authentication to this, it should because we don't want spammers. Connection, connect using my local area network, advanced, pop three. If you change the ports, then you can change the ports here. Right? So Outlook's really kind of a good way of going into the manual configuration of making sure that you can send email back and forth to your SMTP server. Right? If you decide to use SSL and encrypt the connection, your port numbers are going to change and then you have to tell your SMTP server, your Postfix server, that you want to use SSL. It's not required for this because SSL and, and Postfix is a pain in the butt. Yes, ma'am? Where would you put that? You said if you're using SSL, you need this. If you use SSL. You have to let that know. Just click on this button. The server requires SSL to connect, right? And it will automatically change over to the default port for POP3 SSL, right? So outbound, use the following encryption connected, and all the rest of it. So there's a lot of things that you can do here with this to kind of help you troubleshoot that. And then it should bounce off, right? And then it will go ahead and create your Outlook file for you, and then you can go and see. Just send a test email to yourself, see if it will work, right? Now, if it doesn't work, if it doesn't work, We always talked about the var spool directory. Your var spool directory is where it's going to store all the email that it can't send. All right? So your var spool directory is where it's going to send all the stuff that it doesn't know what to do with. All right? So if you go into mail, if there's a problem, you'll see email queuing up here just by CDing into mail. All right? So var spool mail. You'll see stuff queue up here. So that's kind of one way of troubleshooting it, right? Var spool, go into the mail system. If there's stuff queuing up in there, that means it can't send. If it can't send, where do I find logs? Var logs. You'll see something called mail air and mail log. All right? So my mail log is really small because we haven't done anything yet. But you have an air log, a mail air log, and you have a mail log. So your errors will show up if there's an error or misconfiguration or other issue. I can't send. There's not enough coffee in the world for me to send this. My quota is over limit. Um, I'm not feeling really cranky today, so I'll just go ahead and send your stuff. All that kind of shows up in your mail air log. Your mail log will show you where it's working right. Okay. So when you're troubleshooting and debugging this, liberally go and check your email air log, your mail air log. So if I want to check the last 10 entries in my mail log, what do I type?
tail minus 10 male air. All right, so there's ways of doing this to kind of make it work for you. So kind of makes sense? All right, one more thing. All right, one more thing. Spam. All right, so spam is a really interesting problem with a lot of other systems. You can get an anti-spam package through Ubuntu to kind of help you out. It requires a little bit of manual configuration to kind of go along with this, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to install dspam. And the install string is a little bit different on this one. So it's going to be sudo aptitude install dspam. All right, because we want to install a dspam because you never know. You may want to you may want to flog Viagra on the internet. You may not. You may want to have all your users on your email system get this poor Nigerian or Afghanistan prince that wants to send you a lot of money because you look trustworthy on your Facebook profile. All right. So we want to do dspam. So sudo aptitude install dspam. All right. And it will go through and do its thing. All right. And then you hit yep. And then it goes through and it does its thing. Okay, so dspam's in place. And then what we want to do, there's two configuration files, etsy default dspam2, etsy dspam. So we know we need to go into our etsy directory. And we want to make sure that we actually have stuff, right? So you're going to see default perhaps the dspam comp, right? So we want to then do sudo nano dspam.conf. Oops, wrong spot. Go into your dspam directory <laughs> and then go sudo nano dspam.conf. All right, so var spool dspam. This is where it's going to hold every single one of those spam messages that you don't want all the Viagra, all the Cialis, all the Nigerian princess, all the Afghanistani princesses, all of the people thinking that you look trustworthy or really, 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 yes, I'm dying, all the lotteries, all the lotteries, all that stuff is going to be here. It's in a full-blown ISP when you're really looking at stuff, your spam directory can take up a lot of room, right? So there's a way to age this stuff off, but if you're running and you're running into slower processes and other things, just go and clear this directory out because I'm sure that no one really won the UK National Board Lottery Train Ticket -y, Happy Fun, here's 20,000 pounds for just having this IP address. No one wins those. That's not a winning game. All right. So. All right, so trusted delivery agent, user bin, proc mail. That's a standard, right? So nothing to worry about. That we leave that one blank, All right? Untrusted delivery agent. If we have something that's untrusted, if we know that there's a whitelist or something else, we can actually build our own whitelist, but that's a pain in the butt, All right? So we don't want to uncomment this. Otherwise, it's going to not trust everybody, and you want it to trust some people, not everybody, but at least some. So we're going to leave that one commented. SMTP, right, or LDAP delivery. If you want to set it up on a per domain basis, there's a different way of doing this, but you can kind of leave it where it's at, right? Because we're not going to really go ahead and change this. If there's any fallback domains, right, if you want to sp specify a fallback domain. So my domain is instructorcis217highline.edu. My fallback domain can be cis217.highline.edu, right? Or I own a website called comicsforge.com. My fallback domain can be my other website, studio5graphics.com. So there's ways of setting it up so that if one domain is down, I can still get stuff through a separate domain, which is actually really kind of neat if you want to do this, right? 
right? Quarantine, we're not really gonna quarantine anything, right? You can override the behavior. I really don't wanna override the behavior because I really don't wanna see ads for Cialis or Viagra in my inbox, right? So you can override that, right? Yeah, it's just one of those things, right? We're not gonna do any plus, lowercase, or anything else like that. We're not, we can set up a quarantine email box if we want to, but that involves a lot of time with someone actually going through and having to take a look at what's inside the quarantine email box. So that's up to you on whether you've got stuff. If it fails, we just want it to air out. We don't want it to stop. We don't want it to jump up and down or anything else. Trusted users will be allowed to perform administrative function, trust, root, dspam, <laughs> WW data, right? So if we don't want to trust these people, then we can go ahead and do this. Major Domo used to be the older SMTP root kind of account. So because we've kind of moved on from 1920, all right, Major Domo doesn't, we're not going to trust Major Domo. All right. Debug output. If you want to debug stuff, that's that's going to cost you a lot of time. Yeah, um, this is where we get into some of the early internet history. You you know, Alice and Bob are always talking via crypto. Well, Bob and Bill are always talking via email. So this is again, you're going to see a lot of really old stuff in in a lot of these files because you know we just can't let go of the past. Right, alias character to class, we're not gonna worry about that either. But again, just kind of interesting on what we can do. We can do testing, configuration. So, feature the whitelist. Now a whitelist, what's a whitelist? The whitelists are people I trust. If you're not on the whitelist, I don't trust you, right? A blacklist, what's a blacklist? These are people I absolutely do not trust whatsoever in any way, shape, or form, but everyone else is okay. Right? So they feature a whitelist. These are people that I think are okay. Right? So the whitelist are people that I'll just accept email from and I'm not going to sweat it. A whitelist is a little bit more work than a blacklist. Right? A blacklist, you're actually going through and you can mark whole domains as untrustworthy. Right? Now the problem is if you mark 126.com is untrustworthy, that's one of the big Chinese email providers and that could stop you from communicating with anyone that's got a .126.com email address. Right? Not that I know about this. <laughs> right? So just kind of interesting. So we're just going to leave it as a whitelist. We're not going to worry about any kind of tables or anything else. The algorithm for this is what's called Graham Burton. Right? Graham Burton is kind of one of those interesting Bayesian kind of filters? Anybody know what ba Bayesian mathematics is? Oh, really? Bayesian mathematics? You guys don't know what that is? All right. Ba Bayesian mathematics is a way of using weighted output to determine whether it's a good decision or a bad decision. If you guys ever go in and you start using uh, management information systems and you're making decisions for the company, a lot of your stuff is going to be, a lot of the decisions that the computer makes are going to be based on possible outcomes. And the possible outcome, if you see the word Viagra in the subject line, the possible outcome is that this is probably spam. Right? The other waiting on this one is that I've got a really cool thing for you to do. And then inside the emails, please click this link so you can download the file. That's probably going to be phishing. And so we have to tweak our mathematics to say this is either phishing or not phishing. Right? But it's a probability of risk management. It's kind of an interesting way of doing it. Graham Burton is the most sophisticated. So I have to do a whole class just on, on Bayesian mathematics. All right, so we leave that. Again, tokenizer, we want to make sure that what we've got, so the email chain is good to go, so we don't have to sweat it. Nope, 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 nope. Web stats, all right. If you want to write stuff to a stat file, if you want to write stuff to a stat file, that's okay. The problem comes in is that if you leave it as a web stat that I can get to, right? So this will drop it into a stat file itself that you can read later on. If you use some kind of com common gateway interface, some kind of scripting to read that stat file and throw it up as a web page, that's generally a bad idea. 
all right? Because you don't want someone going through your email stats to see what you're accepting, what you're not accepting, what it defines as spam and what it doesn't define as spam. So it's okay to leave this on, just make sure you don't include it on a website that's public facing. That's generally a bad idea, all right? And probability drive, what's ham? Well, okay, ham is a bacon product, right? So all bacon is good. Bacon. Yeah. All right, so ham is stuff that's marked as spam, but it's not really, right? So the computer didn't know what to do with it. It kind of looked like spam, but it maybe not. So your boss sending you an email saying, hey, come to the barbecue this weekend at this address may look like spam, but it's really not because it's coming from your boss, right? And the, w the convention on this one is to call it ham. And that's where the computer can make a bad decision. Yes? Is it anything like, you go on Google now, I have my important emails in one tab, the other one is social, mark social. So anything Facebook link automatically gets thrown in social? No, it's nothing like the tabs that you see in Gmail. It's really a misdiagnosis on the, on the spam package. And then there's, it was an authentic email that you should have gotten, but I accidentally marked it as spam because it had the characteristics and traits of spam, right? So ham is stuff that's marked as spam, but it's not really. Because remember, spam is not really a meat product. So they had to have some fun with it and call it ham. Yes, all right? Preferences, you can reset all your preferences. Right now we're in training mode, right? Because it hasn't done anything yet. We want our computer to learn as we kind of go along on what's spam and what's not spam. So as a user goes through and clicks stuff as spam, the computer goes, oh, okay, this is spam. This now meets that definition. Your computer should stay in training mode as much as possible because people will mark things as, as different as you kind of go through. For one person's spam is another person's good email too. And that's another thing to remember, right? So your training mode should stay on. Spam action, just go ahead and tag it. Mark it as spam. You can do opt-in, opt-out. There's a lot of things you can set here for the preferences, right? And all this stuff is just pretty much so set to default. Right, so we don't have to worry about that. Overrides, if you want to override any configuration, this is where you're going to want to go. Right, now, anybody notice this one over enable BNR? Enable whitelist, foe back to main. So it's going to allow you to override all the stuff that you've got if you want to do an override. When you override it, you're using the user inputted values for this. All right. So you can override what you've done if you have to before. You can do storage profiles. So you can do email storage into a MySQL database, right? Which may actually be really kind of cool if you want to store a bunch of stuff into your MySQL database, if you want to do your email that way. Otherwise, it's going to end up being huge flat text files on your server, right? So if you want to save stuff, so it's all MySQL, um, no one's ever heard of a DEC Alpha. You're probably not. No one's. Anybody here ever heard of Sun Microsystems? Yeah, they're DOA too. Right? So default, you're gonna actually going to have to want to go and do stuff with this. Failover attempts. If uh, a person's failover dies out, I just want you to keep on trying. Ignored headers. Right? All right? Now, perform lookups. Right? If you've got the bandwidth and the energy in your computer, you've got a really good computer to do this. You can actually go and check everything to see if there's an update on the blacklist. Right? Usually people just update their blacklist once every four or five hours now. It used to be days and before that it was weeks. But if you need to go and look up stuff more often, right, you can change that here. So it's basically just a domain lookup to make sure that it's not actually on the blacklist. Right? Because some stuff just looks kind of interesting, but it's not really. Notifications, enable sending of notifications to users, right? Whether it was quarantined or not. If you want to be nice to your user, you'll say notifications on. So they can see if it was really spam or not and let the user make the decision. If you don't care if the user makes the decision or not, leave this as off, right? But because I'm a nice person, I want to make sure that the user has an opportunity to actually state whether it's spam or not. Because one man's spam is another person's, oh my God, I'm gonna be rich because this Nigerian prince just wants to send me billions of dollars, right? 
I know nothing about mining, but I have an opportunity to get into ground floor mining in Afghanistan for a couple hundred bucks. That sounds like a deal to me, right? So notification should be on. And this just lets the user know that we marked something as spam. You can go retrieve it. You can go see if it's really something you want to do. And if you, when you get your Outlook integrated with this and you have it working through your bridge network, right? Send yourself something with the word Viagra or Cialis in it, and it will show you how this whole process works on notification. All right, so notifications is turned on. Quarantine size, it limits the size. Anything after that, it starts dropping stuff off. All right, right now we're leaving the quarantine size open, ended. Purge signatures for anything that looks like bad email after 14 days, which is not a bad, day, which is not a bad idea. Anything with neutral, in other words, if the notification didn't work, right? drop it after 90 days, and they just purged anything that was not read after 90 days. If you're using a SQL database, if you set up your SQL database for mail, this is where you want to go. All right, Local mail exchange, right now I have it set to my local host. Right? If you're going to do this for real, you need to change it to your IP address, to your bridged IP address to your external IP address on your virtual machine. Everybody got that? Your local mail exchange. Right now it's set to localhost because that's where I am, right? If you want to use a private IP address, you want to change it over to 192.168.00 slash 16, right? You can set it to 192.168.203 for this classroom, and what would my number be for that if I set it down to a class C? What's my slash number? What? Yep. So, everybody got that? 24. Yep. So if you just want to accept stuff from 203, it's going to be a slash 24. All right. System log on, right? User log on because you want to see what your system and your users are doing. All right. You want to see if they pick up email. You want to see what they're up to. Spying on users can be fun. Just ask the government. Right, opt in, opt out. If you want to go ahead and opt into DSPAM's default filtering behavior, that's cool. You don't have to, right? So I'm just going to leave that as uh, as out, and that means everyone's going to be filtered, right? Because not everyone wants to have breast enlargement transplants. I know I don't. Big admin plants. Um, you know, the, the enlargement pills that my mom gets ads for. <laughs> all right, again, spam. It's all just there to, to go through. Track resor any resource addresses, track and report them back to syslog, right? If you're running a firewall or blacklist, that's cool, right? But if you want to track the sources of where you're getting spam, right, you can turn that on. And the reason why I'm going to turn that on is because of the virus. Right? Because people send malware all the time through email, even though it generally doesn't work because I need you to click off to a site that's been compromised. Right? Track sources for spam, non-spam, and viruses. This gives you the ability of helping build out your whitelist, blacklist thing and helps you identify dangerous sites that your users may go to that then you can share with your network engineer saying, hey, we should just go ahead and block this site at the firewall because it's compromised 19 different ways from Sunday. Right? So, track sources, I'm just going to turn on because I really do want to know where all the bad and good and in the world is coming from, right? Parse headers, we're not going to worry about, right? We're not going to worry about broken MTA options, right? Max message size, if we want to do this, right? We can, we can set a max message size. Um, Google sends a max message size of 25 megabits. Right? If you've got people that are shipping 100 gigabit emails back and forth between each other because they're including videos, it's going to happen. Right? You can set a max size should you choose to. If you, yep. Now, this thing will also integrate with Clam antivirus, which is really good for Unix. Right? So you can actually integrate this in with Clam antivirus. So you can actually go through and then check those emails for malicious software along the way if you install Clan AV, right? So this is another way of finding out and securing email because email is like one of those things that you really kind of need to worry about and make sure that you're not sending your CEO 
a virus, Trojan, weaponized email, because they're already going to click through on the links from the CFO that's not really the CFO to this really cool website to see where management's going with IT, right? So if you install Clam AV, this is where you're going to go ahead and set it up. All right. Client server, server host, if you're going to go ahead and do upstream configuration to run DSPAM, right? You can set an upstream provider to use your DSPAM as well and share information between computer systems, which is really kind of neat. So if I have a lot of email servers across the board, I can just set up DSPAM on one and then have everybody talk to that one DSPAM server on a separate server. But because we're going to be local, just one-on-one, -on -one, one email server, one spam, one spam session, we're just going to kind of leave this so that we're not doing any kind of upstream, right? Server node, if you want to do relay passwords, you can do relay. What's a, what's a relay? A relay when you're kind of going through this is that I can bounce email through your email system to someone that's not even on your domain. So if I'm Dan at evil.com and I notice that Bub, Bob at Bubbla.com is opening up a relay, I can go from Dan to Bubbla to target.com and spearfish the CEO that way and it will look like it's coming from someone else. It won't really look like it's coming from me unless you actually start looking at the message transport headers. Right? There's always an originating source, dan.evil.com. If you ever get an email from dan.evil.com, just kill it. Just hit delete. Don't open it. Don't look at it. Don't go, oh, hey, it's Dan. <laughs> right? right? And I think that's pretty much so it for this thing. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so that should be pretty much so it for that, but that's the configuration file, right? So we want to go ahead and we want to save it. How do I check to see if DSPAM's running? All right, so it's not running right now, right? Yeah, we can just restart the service, all right? Unknown job or service, so I've got to go find the. <laughs> See, I'm just getting all excited about this. All right, yeah, we're good. So it's up and running. It's amazing what happens when you type the right command in at the at, in Unix. Yep. All right, so that's basically it. That's email and that's DSAM. So that's email and spam. Ham. Bacon. Bacon. All right. So are there are any questions on how to do this right now? All right. This is the last service I'm going to have you guys set up. Right? So remember, your designs are due when? Next Friday. What format do they have to be in? Visio. Huh? MS Paint. No. All right, so your opportunity now is to get together with your team, start doing the layouts, the designs, practice this. I'll come through on Friday and make sure everyone's got spam, um, their spam and their post fix up and running, right? And then you've got design next week, and then after that, once it's been cleared through management, your designs. Once it's been cleared through management, you can start building. So any questions at all, this is your chance.